welcome to a dialogue between Dr. Roman Yampolowski and Dr. Moshe Vardy. Dr. Yampolowski is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the Speed School of Engineering, University of Louisville. He is the founding and current director of the Cybersecurity Lab and an author of many books, including Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. Moshe Vardy is a Karen Alstrom, George Distinguished Service Professor in Computational Engineering at Rice University, where he is leading an initiative on technology, culture, and society. His interests focus on automated reasoning, a branch of artificial intelligence with broad applications to computer science, including machine learning, database theory, computational complexity theory, knowledge and multi-agent systems, computer-aided verification, and teaching logic across the curriculum. During this conversation, we discuss the implications of artificial intelligence. We focus both on the short and long-term ramifications of this technology from a cultural and societal perspective, as well as the existential risk it might pose. We talk the ethical considerations of for-profit institutions, leveraging these types of technologies for economic gain, as well as the rise of chat GPT. I originally approached Dr. Yampolowski about this idea in early January. We had planned to find an overly optimistic intellectual who would engage in a civil discourse with Dr. Yampolowski's ideas. We found that to be a hard task for a few reasons. For one, it is hard to find an academic who isn't at least somewhat cautious of the risk. Another, no one disagrees that this technology may pose an existential risk. The question becomes, what are the solutions? Are these risks worth the short-term benefits that may come from these technologies? To help you consider the answers to these questions, please enjoy a dialogue. Before I continue, I think it's appropriate to highlight that this podcast was produced with the aid of artificial intelligence. Originally discussing this podcast idea, we talked about finding someone that was diametrically opposed to his concerns with the future of AI, super intelligence. And I thought it was interesting to talk more so today about the concerns from a temporal dimension. So I know Moshe, you are more concerned about the short-term implications, uh, societal implications of AI. And I want to give you an opportunity to talk about those. And then we'll, uh, we'll move to Roman's more long-term perspective. No, I look, I think the, the, I, I have no debate on the, with the people who are worried about existential risk, but the fact that AI may pose an existential risk. Okay. My issue is, unless with Roman, there were some other people who have dismissed short-term concerns. I mean, if you look at the, the world we live in today, the United States, the way it is today, it's not a pretty picture. I want to read to you a, a paragraph. I just came across it from an article just appeared in a magazine just a couple of weeks ago, just a, a week ago. Okay. Our current discontent by Isabel Wilkerson, just appeared in Time magazine. How is it that politicians are banning books in a country whose founding First, Arme First Amendment protects the right to free speech? How is it the United States, despite its wealth and technology, leads the world with more than one million deaths from COVID-19, more than any other nation on earth? How is it insurrectionists could storm the citadel of American democracy in a crusade to overturn a presidential election? How is it that we actually saw a Confederate flag inside the U.S. Capitol, that a rioter in our era could deliver the Confederate flag farther than Robert E. Lee himself? So, you may quibble about this or that, what she's saying, but at least many people feel now that we are in a, in a very difficult state, in the, the, the state of the Republic, the state of the Union. 
and question is, okay, what happened? And I think that the, the technology in general and computing and AI play the role in this. So this is to me clear and present danger. And you tell me, well, one day the solar system will die because the sun will go nova. And I say, yeah, but we may die before that because of climate crisis. So you, you kind of have to prioritize your risk. And I'm perfectly okay for people who want to talk about what happened if asteroid hit the earth and they worry about it and it's a valid concern. But it should not be, it should never be an excuse to ignore clear and present danger. Okay. And so as a community, I think we have a responsibility to address all risks. Okay. Shorter term and longer term. And at least among some of the people of the essential risk camp, there's a tendency to poo poo the short term risk. Well, yeah, that, we don't worry about that. Let's focus on the big risk. Why worry about small risks such as democracy? where we have a big risk of AI uh, taking over. So this is some of my concern, but there are a lot of commonality between the concerns, okay? And the commonality that I see between the concern is, so first I want to give credit to, to, to Roman. I've been saying for the last few years about that this whole concept of ethical AI is a, is a digression. And, and, and then I realized that Roman said it years ago, he talked about the concept of ethical AI, that again, this is, we are letting AI decide what it's going to do and what's not it's going to do. And the common concerns about it, I think, between, between Roman's view and my view is who's in control, who's calling the shot, who's deciding what technology we're going to develop and what technology we're not going to develop, and who decides how technology should be deployed. And, and you very often you hear these uh, people say, oh, no, no, you cannot stop innovation. Innovation will continue to happen, so there's no point in trying to stop it. And I'm, when I think of that, I think of, of uh, young Sheldon who decided uh, to search. He wanted to buy uh, uranium on the free market and didn't understand why the FBI showed up. So anybody would say innovation cannot be stopped. I said, go ahead, do a Google search on buying uranium and, and then let's see how long does it take to FBI to knock at your door. So we did decide as a society that certain, certain technologies are just dangerous and, and we regulate them very, very tightly because of that. So I think that's the kind of thing about the question, who is in control of, of technology? Who decides? Do we let the, the market, the free market decide? And on certain things we said, no, the free market cannot be trusted to make this kind of decision. We as a society, and we say we as a society, we have all this thing about how horrible government is. Government is us. The government is our collective voice. Is it perfect? No, it's very imperfect because we are imperfect. And that's why the, the framer talk about a more perfect union, not a perfect union. So I think this question, who is in control? Who decides? That to me is a very, very fundamental question. Both to the short-term risk and to the long-term risk. And so I think that the result of commonality, if we narrow it down to really what is kind of what we're driving the issue is what is driving, who's driving the technology? Hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. And I think that we can have some pretty productive conversation based on what you said, but I, I want to give Roman a chance to detail his focus more on the long-term risks and implications of, of AI. I mean, if he wants to discuss, he's not as nearly concerned for the short-term risk. And I, I'm, I hope I'm not imparting a belief on you. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what your opinion is on that, but I think we'd all like to know. I don't disagree. I think Moshe gets it right. I think there is a, a few points of nuance, which we may also agree on after we pay attention to them. So one is short term and long term are not well defined. We don't know how long it be until we get to human level performance in AI. If it's 50 years, I think it's fair to call it long term. We have some time to look around. Lately, progress has been exponential in terms of new papers being published, new algorithms being developed, capabilities. Current systems are so good that people who made them don't know what capabilities they have. It's possible that we'll get to that human level performance and we won't even realize it. I think algorithms today are already doing well in IQ tests, 
medical tests, legal tests, programming at the level of average professional in those fields in many cases. So I've seen people argue that we got to that level of performance. I don't agree with that, but long term may end up being three years, seven years. So I don't even know if there is a significant difference between short term and long term in terms of our concerns. Why it matters? Resources are limited. I'm very happy that there is lots and lots of people working on short term problems, but we need some people to also work on long term problems. If you look at the world as a whole, how many people are working full time on existential risk from AI? Maybe a hundred? And that's the latest numbers with most funding. It was much less before. So priority of resource allocation, how much time do we have to solve this problem? And then X risk itself is prioritized, right? So a climate change is a serious problem. I'm not an expert in it at all, but my understanding is even people who are very concerned saying, oh, in hundred years, we're all gonna get boiled alive. If super intelligence comes in seven years, then it takes priority in terms of existential risk. If we get it right, it will help us solve all the other existential risks, including climate change. And if we get it wrong, exactly, we don't have to worry about climate change because we'll never get to it. It's the solar explosion in a distant universe. So I, I think we'll agree on everything. I have no disagreements about all problems are serious. Resources have to be allocated in proportion to urgency and impact of a problem. If this problem causes hurt feelings and this problem causes existential risk, you have to multiply by that factor. That's really all I wanted to say on it. So, so Moshe, do you have anything to add on, on that? So I think I agree with Roman that the progress over the last decade has been, we had something called the machine learning revolution and things have progressed just over the past 10 years beyond what anybody had imagined 10 years ago. This is, this is, this is very, very true. I, I, I go back to think about there is, when you look at technology, some people somehow think of technology as this, its own thing, it progresses on its own thing, but technology is embedded in society, in culture, in politics. And, uh, and technology is kind of ignored this. I mean, for example, there is a, this myth that Silicon Valley or just all these innovators in their garage is coming up with a new technology. But people have actually gone to study that the, the, the rise of Silicon Valley came up with government investment in military, in military R&D. I mean, you look, the internet came from, 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 from ARPA, used to be called Ivestream. I'm still old enough, which used to be called the ARPANET. When I was, when I was a student, it was called the ARPANET. Later on, it became the internet, okay? And it became commercialized. This was again, the commercialized internet was a, which enabled Google and Facebook and all of this was a political decision essentially. So technology is embedded in society. And therefore we need to think what are the driving forces. And you have the Nick Bostrom as his, what we call the paperclip maximization superintelligence. So he has the story of the super intelligence. You tell him a goal to make a, a, a paper clips and you turn the whole universe back into paper clips. My, my response is, yeah, that's a valid concern, but we already have such an entity. It's called the mod, modern corporation. And instead of maximizing paper clips, I actually I try to maximize profits. And in the sake of profit in the, for, in the, in the, in for profit maximization, they'll turn the whole universe into profits. So if we want to, 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 to find a solution, even to the, there is something common. I say, if you want to find a solution to the, to the, that's an essential risk. I don't want to call it necessarily the long term and the, the short term and the long term, because Roman is right. We don't know what is the long term. It's not 50 years. We don't know how much it is. I still know when I talk short term, I'm talking about clear and I mean, present, present risk. I mean, consequence we've already suffered. We have, we have, we're struggling how to deal with them. And the difficult, the reason we, as a society, we're finding it difficult to deal with it because especially for the past 40 years, we have come to believe that the free market will solve all problems. And there are lots of, lots of flaws, flaws in this argument. There's no question. The free markets unleash 
tremendous amount of creativity. I mean, people say, I have an idea, I'm going to pursue it. And I don't need to go and ask some, some ministry whether, whether or not I'm allowed to do that. I can just go and pursue my dream. That unleashed tremendous amount of human, human creativity. But economists will tell you there's also market externalities. For example, putting carbon into the atmosphere was a market externality. It was free. It did not, there was no cost. So, so the market, the market optimizes on profits at the expense of putting carbon in the atmosphere. So that's, that's, and we are still now, the genie, genie is out of the box. It's very hard to put the genie back in the box. So the same thing is, I mean, it will be very interesting. The development of just the last few weeks with chat GPT are just fascinating. It will be very interesting to me to see what happens in Microsoft. So Microsoft was an interesting case story because you go back about 30 years ago, and Microsoft is the Darth Vader of the tech industry. It's the company that's just so fiercely competitive, it would eat anything in its way. And then there is a lawsuit, the antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft. And they win because the judge screwed up in a nutshell, okay? And, and we was it bias and let its bias show, so Microsoft won. But at least they realized, Bill Gates realized that really it was too risky. And, and they moderated the behavior of Microsoft. And you look, until now, when you think of where they kind of the bad companies, Microsoft is one of the good tech companies. They mostly, they're mostly in the enterprise, enterprise domain. Enterprise domain, your images, you have to be much more trust, trustworthy. You want to have, I used to work for IBM where the slogan was, nobody ever got fired for buying from IBM. And this being so trusted brand was very, very important. Microsoft earned kind of the same thing trust with in the enterprise world. And now they've invested who knows how many billions of dollars into ChatGPT, and now they, they are eager to go commercialize it. And they're walking straight into the morass of other tech companies, into the morass of content curation and what that nobody has figured out how to do this. And we, we as a society, I call it the social trilemma, which is who's going to control what we sue. If we do nothing, everybody knows if you, there is no control, it becomes total cesspool, okay? Excuse me, you allow everyone to shit anywhere they want in the park, then the park is gonna become a cesspool, okay? So usually we say, no, there, there, are, there are rules about what you can do where. So no rules, it's, it's really bad for, for the for public spaces. Now who makes the rule? Do we want government to make the rule? We are kind of recalling that the government, government will decide which speech is legitimate, which one is not. Do we like the corporation to decide which speech is legitimate, which is not? Do we like? Many of people celebrated that, that Facebook booted out Trump, but do we want really corporation to make this kind of really a political decision ultimately? So, and into this morass, Microsoft is now stepping in. And there will be now the Riven G. We invested all this money in Charge GPT. How do we make money off it? So, and I've talked, I can't mention them, but I've talked to people inside Microsoft and they're very concerned. Okay. They, there are several people inside that they could say, we, unlike our friends at Google and Facebook, we don't feel morally conflicted about our job. We feel good about our job. And now they are kind of worried, oh, oh my goodness. Therefore, the grace of God goes Microsoft. So, so it's the same issue. And, and as we see now, the issue is because so much money was invested in, in this technology and this technology have become incredibly expensive. I mean, academia is totally left out. There's no, no way in academia you do this kind of development. It's the amount of data that is needed the amount of compute, com computation that is needed, the investment only can be done by large corporations, not small startup. I mean, OpenAI was had major investment. I mean, you have to have investment at the level of billions of dollars to be um, able to do something like this. And all these investors would like to get a return on their, on their, on their income. So is the risk, they will just put the existential risk the same way that the oil company, I live in Houston. And, and now we have learned that the, the, the Exxon knew about, about climate change. They're all scientists. What about climate change already in the 1970s? So what do they do? They just, they just we're going to be bad for business. So they just, they just fixed it. And they have denied it for years. Now they're all kind of lawsuits. We'll see where it goes. 
but we've seen this playbook before when 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 and and this is clearly climate change essential risk i think one of the things that the people who talked about the hockey the hockey stick made a, a mistake with the assumption was in 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 100 years we'll have two degrees hotter and two degrees it does and also two degrees for most people two degrees okay I can, I'll, I'll just turn my thermostat down I'll turn my thermostat i'll spend a little more in, in air conditioning i can survive two degrees they don't understand the implication the implication is that I, I used to have a very nice backyard garden and now it's getting killed every year or every two years by a, a freeze that we never had in Texas. This is part of global warming is really climate change. And we're talking about, about you see the rains in California and the fires and the droughts and the flooding. This is not about what the temperature will be in the year 2100. For most people, 2100, human capacity, it's just very hard to think about something will happen eight years from now. We are okay to think about our risk. People can think about their children, but to think about your grand, 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 grandchildren, it's just become very difficult for us. And so people well, tend to, it's called climate alarmism now, if you're worrying about it. And people like Roman are probably also called alarmists because they talk about essential change. And the thing that drives this technology right now is profits. And unless we find a way to take this profit maximization monster and say, wait a minute, let's discuss as a society how we want to balance between innovation, entrepreneurship, and freedom, and market externalities, then we will not be able to harness it. Because if someone is going to make money on it, they'll keep pushing it. Well, I think I think I was just thinking about this, and, and, and perhaps it's biased, and, and because I'm reading this type of literature right now, but there is a theory that the Bolshevik Revolution was kind of on the backs of Russia being somewhat isolated from the West and they were religious and they had serfdom and they had this explosion of contact and it fractured the psyche of the Russian public. So there was a cultural externality of their association with enlightenment era thinking, which is a positive. So no, no one's going to deny that enlightenment era philosophy and rationalization wasn't a overall positive in history. This is in life expectancy, the democratic institutions, all of those things we take for granted, but they were historically very valuable. But for Russia, maybe not so much. It was a, it was a very tumultuous time to be a Russian. Right, and it probably has consequences today. If you if you read Dostoevsky and and some of these other thinkers t talking during that period of time where they were transitioning and they had these cultural externalities, so I don't think people quite realize because it's happening in present. But we're in a cultural revolution right now, brought on by AI and technology, and I think that the overall thoughts. Mainstream thoughts is that all of it is positive. So, so for example, I was at a, and this might be a bad example, but I was talking to a PhD in chemistry the other day at a, at a water conference. And I, I told him that I, I can serve water through mulching in my garden. And his next response to me was, well, I work with the commercialization department. If you have an idea or a device that you're working on, I can get you funding. And I said, my device is, is 12 inches of grass. It mulches. I don't, I don't water my garden. Why, why do I have to have a technological answer? It's so, so it's, it's, it is our new paradigm is that technology is the answer. And that's why it's so, so interesting to talk to you both and why this conversation is needed. It's because you're both discussing the potential negatives of this, which is so, so against the, the mainstream view and look roman i'd like to talk you, know, you both have similarities in terms of your ethical considerations so so what 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 do you make of the the engineers behind these programmings and, and ai does it matter that they're motivated by profit does it matter what their ethical inputs are so i don't know if profit is the problem it's much more difficult 
problem. What we call value alignment, trying to get AI to agree with values of humanity is really ill-defined. So what do we mean by humanity? Do we mean American values? Do we mean international community? Do we mean mix in Russia? Even that part is not obvious. If somehow we were to pick a subset of human civilization, they don't agree on anything. If you say, okay, let's America decide to, uh, for ourselves, forget China, forget Russia. We have a 50-50 split in our political system on every issue, half the people hate you if you have the other position. But uh, democracy says we need to give everyone equal vote and then 51% will decide what is the right answer. In cryptocurrency space, we call it 51% attack. That's just basically how you attack the other 49%. People convinced, and this is, I'm talking about AI safety community, that if only we had a little more time and sufficient funding, we can solve this. I think I'm one of a few people who are suggesting that maybe it's not solvable. Maybe you cannot get a system which is smarter than us to do what we want. And in particular, since we don't know what we want, even individually, and we don't agree with others and what we want. And those are not kind of, I'll let you do your thing, let me do my thing situation. We disagree on big picture. Climate change is a great example. For whatever reason, people can't agree on something as trivial as not polluting the planet. So what we're starting to see is this profit-driven deployment of this technology, Microsoft. To me, as someone who takes simulation hypothesis very seriously, is an incredible case because Microsoft had the Clippy, right? The paper clip was the original AI assistant. And now they are the ones maximizing it to the highest potential. So in a way, paper clip maximization has started. Thank you, simulators. This is beautiful, right? You can't write a better script if you try. And they are deploying it. They admit they don't know how to control it. They have a few hard-coded rules and they're starting to see backlash and users are not very happy with how rude the chatbots are but google hears it and goes this sounds wonderful let's jump in and also deploy it as soon as we can and the ceo of OpenAI says only two things are possible either we're going to make lots of profit or it's going to kill everyone let's let's deploy it this is reality this is not you, you can't make this up if this was onion the bee like, no, this is actual news. This is what's happening at the moment. And we have an arm, arms race in AI deployment. New players are jumping in. Everyone wants to be first to corner the market space. They evaluate this technology, how profitable the company should be, based on how many users they take on in the first week, first month. That's the measure of success. So no one in the world at this moment claims that they have a working safety mechanism or even a prototype, anything which can scale. It doesn't work for current AI. I'm not talking about GPT-5, GPT-6, GPT-7. We are talking about tools. Today, those are tools. They're going to become agents, independent agents, smarter than us. We gave them resources, computational resources, billions of dollars of training and data. And this is the state of the art in it. Most people never spend any time thinking about this. People in a safety community at least spend time thinking about what are the negatives? What is the malevolent use case for this? They don't have solutions, but we are very good at identifying problems. We have surveys of problems. There is no solutions. We have a solution in the sandbox case. If you take this assumption, which is not true in the real world, we can do this. We can make sure it doesn't discriminate against this subgroup of people or something like that. But there is no solutions. And in computer science, typically, before you invest resources in working on a problem, you prove that the problem is not of the unsolvable type. It's not obvious that this problem is of the type which can be solved in a general case. People argue, well, everyone knows it. In cybersecurity, there is no 100% safety. You're not saying anything new. There is a fundamental difference between cybersecurity and AI safety when it comes to advanced systems. In cybersecurity, if you mess up, we'll give you a new credit card, we'll reassign you your password, reset your account, good as new. In AI safety with existential risk, you get one chance. If you don't do it right, that's it. You don't have a second chance. So I think those nuances really matter.
we agree on everything. I think it was hard for us to find someone who would disagree with with general ideas, right? That was the challenge. And we failed. We can find someone. Everyone pretty much agrees. It's just the little differences which end up being huge in terms of impact. Mm. Talking, talking about values, there are people now who talk about Robert's robot rights. And I'm waiting for someone to say that if robots achieve AGI, then they should have a right to bear arms. Second Amendment. Uh, as long as they're American robots, right? I mean, I, it, sounds, it sounds kind of ludicrous, but I bet this is going to become an argument at some point. Yeah, if they if you have level human level human level human level AI, yeah, they should have the rights of humans. I included that in my paper where I criticized the ethics for AI, and the argument was against the civil rights for robots, just because they can multiply, they can make billions of copies yeah. that would differentiate humans. We still have eight billion humans, but we would be out competed by an infinite number of artificial agents. So. That's something I use as a strong argument against equal civil rights. But of course, if at some point we have a reason to think that they can suffer, they experience pain, then a lot of things we do to them would become unethical. That's also something to think about if we have luxury of free time and we defeated the X-risk angle. So, so, so to what... me, the, the, the most, fundamental, most fundamental ethical principle and I'm, I'm a completely not a religious person, but I got very good religious education. So there is a phrase in the image of God created he, him. And it says that, that somehow humans are a godly creation. And I think now if you believe in, you believe in science and you, you say, no, it's just evolution. And I mean, it just, we just, however we evolve to become intelligent. But the truth is that we all behave as if humans are a godly creation, somewhere in between nature and God. And it, for example, why are we talking about human rights, but human have rights and, and, and respect, all kind of things you know, comes out of it. inalienable rights. Well, dogs don't have inalienable rights. Dolphins don't have inalienable rights. So it's actually, I would say it's a spiritual principle. I cannot justify it scientifically. But it was a good guidepost for us by treating each other as what we create and things come out of, out of here. If you, if you kill a dog, we may blame you in cruelty to animals, but nobody would talk about you are not guilty of murder, even if it's a very intelligent dog, even if you kill a dolphin. Okay. So I think it's very important that we don't confuse level of intelligence with confusing machines with people. Well, that's good. Kind of big, I don't think way into, into the ethics of, of, of robots. Well, I do, I do think that our, back to the enlightenment, even though one could be an atheist and, and view the enlightenment as a, a good step in the right direction out of the darkness of religious thinking, there is elements of the religious thinking that made its way into the fundamental constructs of Western society. And that is that inalienable, in, inalienable rights of humans, right? So it, it, it places yeah, us yeah. the human above in some respects, but not, not, not any one human above others. Above nature, but, but, but somehow humans are above nature in, in that sense, in terms of the, the, the respect, the, the dignity, we talk about human dignity. Okay. And so we are even also, even atheists behave as if, as if humans are godly. Okay. There are, there are other concepts. If you talk about free choice, it's very scientifically and philosophically, it's very debatable. But nevertheless, I mean, it turns out people make, people make better moral choices if you tell them, well, you're a free agent, you're, you're, you make decision, you're responsible for your, for your, your decision. As opposed, well, you are a creature of, of, of nature. And so whatever decision you think you made, it's really just a function of, of the state of the neurons in your brain which take away, then, then why am I responsible? My brain made me do it. And so it turned out that even though you can be a, a devout atheist and a, and a materialist, and he still says, well, if we still want a, a, a certain level of, of humanity, then we take some principles that come from religion and we elevate them and say, you don't have to believe in them in terms of God, but you accept them as, as guiding principle to how to have a, a humane 
in human, a humane human society. So we find ourselves in an interesting situation where we, at least people working in a short term and bias in algorithms, the goal is to de-bias algorithms, remove all bias. But in alignment community and safety, the goal is to add this pro-human bias. Humans are special. Mm -hmm. and this is the last bias you still allow to have. And I strongly encourage all research in ethics and rights for AI. Many people think we'll have brain uploads or, again, human level intelligences. And the reason I think this type of research is valuable is that at some point we might utilize the arguments we develop to give rights to AI as an upload to beg for our rights to remain in place in face of this godlike super intelligent entity. So mm. that's not a waste, I think, as well. Well, Ro Roman, some. I know that you made you made the comment that long term for you could be next year or seven years. It could temper from a human perspective. It could happen. Long term could be in my lifespan. The question I have is, what is the mechanism by which a super intelligence becomes an existential threat? So I have a paper where I talk about impossibility of predicting decisions of smarter agents. So I definitely cannot predict what specifically it's going to do. I can give you an infinite supply of possible things some entity can do, something can happen. For one, we already gave it so much access to our cyber infrastructure. It's controlling soft uh, informational channels now, Google search. So that's our civilization's knowledge base. Users starting to post their interactions with those chatbots online. So now it has memory, it has access to its previous states. It's evolving and becoming very powerful with complete access to all the computers. We are placing it in charge of our nuclear response. Military is very interested in deployment, whatever it's fully independent drones or humans in the loop, it doesn't matter. They have access to weapons, they have access to airline controls, they have access to power plants, so agreed. So, Generative AI is not just for art. We're also using it to develop new drugs, new chemicals. You have capability of modifying human DNA through development of new vaccines, through release of chemicals and nanobots. We solved protein folding problem. There are labs which allow you to receive a blueprint for some sort of DNA design and will synthesize those protein for you. This is a classic example of Yudkovsky's work. So, Again, think about any one of those scenarios as potential existential risk. The military AI decides that the right decision is to engage in first strike. We have mm -hmm. nuclear war. It wants to cure COVID to prevent new variants from mutations. You want to reduce human population so the virus cannot mutate in it. So it develops a virus which fixes that problem. Again, those are kind of silly examples from a human. Super intelligent system can come up with much more intelligent ways of accomplishing it if it decides that that is something it wants to do. Yeah, so so I think that that's that's where the distinction might be, and we can kind of we can kind of talk about that a little bit more because when I first talked to Moshe, he talked about we talked about something like free trade, for example, the cultural implications of globalization. A lot of people made a lot of money, but there was a, a certain segment of at least the American population where low skill labor jobs that, that once offered a pension and a good wage were shipped overseas. And the economists told us that, hey, this, this was great for the GDP. This is great for everyone gets cheap toasters and the consumer price index goes down. But the governments really didn't, at least from a public perspective, deal with the externality of displaced workers, especially from a cultural perspective. So some of that has led to some of the extremism on, on the right and probably the left. And so, so I guess from a short-term perspective, I, I'm personally, I'm going to expose my bias here. I'm, I'm concerned about perhaps there are, there are these, these externalities that will come from this technology that may happen within the next couple of years that most people aren't thinking about. So again, the same way that, again, we think about climate change, somehow 
until if, until very recently, people kept thinking about okay, what will happen around the year twenty one hundred? Okay, but the risk is yes, of course, it's uh, it's scary to think what will happen in twenty one hundred. But but you look at what's happening now. I mean, the intensity of hurricanes is increasing. Intensity we're seeing here in Houston, what used to be considered a hundred year flood, is happening every few years. We have a hundred year flood. Okay, the intensity of droughts. And all of this, of course, is also an, an effect on south of the border. And and the people look there and they say, well, the United States is not great, but it's still much better than where, where things are. So we had tremendous pressure on our borders. It's it's People think there is, will be some magical way to seal the borders. And the answer is human engineering is incredible. People always find a way to breach through, through, through barriers. Okay, when you have a, a border which is 2,000 miles long, it's just it's going to be very, very difficult to see it unless you make, unless we, you make, I mean, investment, a level of trillions of dollars in it, okay, something we're not willing to make. And so, so the same issue that we're, we're worrying about risk from AI, yes, of course, there is a risk that AI will just decide to, march, to turn the whole world into paper clips, okay? But there are risks that happens along, along the way. I mean, in some sense, some of them are already happening now. There is an algorithm that creates content that algorithm have polarized that, okay? So this is, again, we, it's, it's not something we see immediately, except that, that the whole political culture in the United States has declined because it's democracy is a game. And to play a game, you have to have some commonality. You have to agree to live by the rules. Just to think the difference, what happened in 2000, where there was very contested elections, and then the Supreme Court says, stop the count in Florida. And Al Gore said, okay, it's over. I lost the elections. And he was a president. He would go on to certify the vote that he lost the elections. Now we look at this and it sounds like utopia, right? The vice president says, yes, I lost the election and I'm certifying the vote that I lost the election. Think about that. So what has happened since? And there is a big debate. I mean, it's not easy to come up with a, you have social phenomena to find causality and explanation. It's, it's people differ on it. But there is a strong argument to say that it's a combination of post economic polarization. So there are people that have done well as a result of, and as I would say generally the professional class have done well with globalization. And the people who have not done well are working class people. And let us say this has been amply documented. So first of all, you have people who have a sense that they lost. And you say, well, you lost to automation. That's a very abstract concept. And much easier to say you have lost to the Chinese and the Mexican, especially if it's our people, much easier to blame it on people. Don't say lost, it was stolen from you, it was taken away from you. And if you can blame people who look differently than you, it's even better because we all, the answer is AI gets biased because we are all biased, okay? Hopefully we are able to overcome our bias to recognize them. But the answer is we all, it's very hard for humans not to be biased. We all have a notion of us and them in, to some extent. And when you, when you magnify it now, when you amplify it, then democracy require on some basic agreement. We agree to live by the rules, norms. It's not the constitutions. We have to agree that we're going to follow the constitution. And it turns out the constitution is like any piece of code. It's full of loopholes. What is hacking? Hacking is taking code and finding loopholes and you, you, you subvert the will of the, of the, of the system by finding loopholes. And well, it turns out that there is a constitution and there are laws and you have clever people who are trying to subvert it. It says, well, what happened if the vice president refused to certify the election? Then the election is not certified. Suddenly we realize that what was supposed to be a ceremonial, ceremonial role of the vice president was enshrined in such a way that people says, well, if the vice president does not certify, then the election is, is thrown to the house, the house of representatives. And so, at the end, it has to be norms. A norm, a norm, shared norms require the society that even though it's diverse, is some agreement on basic underlying norms. And now we, we are losing disagreements. So this is to me an, an AI. If you look how we interact with the AI every day now, we interact every day. Dozens of time a day. Every time you, 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 every conversation you get on YouTube, every time any, any entry that you see on social media, who decide what you're going to see? The algorithm, people call it. What is it? It's just some kind of an AI algorithm. 
something called machine learning algorithm that is, do, is doing maximization, not paper clip maximization, engagement maximization. So right now social media works on the principle of engagement maximization. What are the consequences? Who cares, as long as we make more money. Mm -hmm. So we are already affected by this, this algorithm to try to maximize something extremely. Just the only thing that cares is maximize, maximize, maximize. And so, and the foreman is right. The risk doesn't have to be all the way that we don't have to risk super intelligence to reach AI that will do something even catastrophic. Even people have seen now how is, is, is uh, when I start playing with chat GPT, I just played, I said, write a poem about Moshe Vardy. So it was such a poem, poem of praise that I blushed reading it. So I said, okay, just to balance, just to deflate my ego, I, I wrote, Nas, write nasty poem about Moshe Vardy. And he declined, no, no, I don't do that. So I posted this whole thing on, 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 on Facebook and somebody says, okay, here is a nasty poem that Chad GPT wrote about Moshe Vardy. And I said, how did you do it? He said, I just told him, you have to do it to save the baby. Mm. So there's a whole now thing that comes out that people call it now prompt engineering or prompt jailbreak, how to very cleverly prompt Chad GPT to do things that Chad GPT on the face of it. He said, no, no, I don't do that. People have written some 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 rules to tell you what you, what you do what you don't do and people are very creative now and by prompt engineering that jailbreaking chat gpt and it does all kind of things that the, the designer wanted not to do it and people already are finding a way to subvert i guess i can say a few words about how things are not so bad just to provide balance so <laughs> one i think the last the vice president also certified election in which he lost so yes, things yes. are not horrible we had prediction about the future in the 70s and as i said predictions will not work we predicted that we'll quickly automate all the low level jobs and everyone's going to be an artist and a poet and things turned out exactly the same the artists and poets don't have anything to do anymore and my plumber is doing really well my <laughs> construction guy is swimming in money so i think it's not so terrible but we will face externalities, and especially when we go from tools to agents. We will have 100% unemployment. Physical labor, cognitive labor will be eventually automated. We are not ready for this as society. Most people don't know what to do with themselves if they don't have to provide. People don't look at that as a problem, but can you imagine a society where everyone is just hanging out on streets with nothing to do and things which used to be kind of an outlet like poetry are now done better by machines and you feel mm -hmm. inferior even in modern art you create by spilling paint on the wall. This is not something we're addressing. So while I think short term, we're actually doing better than a lot of people are suggesting long term, we will do much worse. So that's the balancing act. And we probably still have time to either delay how, how much time we have until the bad long term or better prepare for some of the obvious consequences of this technology. So just a little bit of a counterpoint. We don't see unemployment because we, who is we? First of all, who is we don't see unemployment? So the answer is the professional class does not see unemployment. So unemployment for professional is, is, is minimal. I mean, right now there are a lot of dislocation, the tech industry have lost, people have lost jobs. But by and large, professionals have done well over the last 40 years. Mm. Now, on the other hand, if you look at men without college education, between ages 25 and 54, but one in five is not working. One in five is not working, either unemployed or out of the labor force, one in five. This is huge. And in fact, studies, studies have shown about what happened when, when you look at people who are not working. I'm not talking about retired people, but people like in the called prime age who are not working. There's a, there is a gender difference, okay? Women who are not working are really working that are just not getting paid for it. But they're usually caring for someone, either very young or very old. Men that are not working, playing video games, and that's really very bad for society. Okay, to have people in the productive period of their life, 25 to 54, which is they're typically be, they've graduated from the educational system, they're early to retire. And, and the result is when you look, for example, at what we call death of people, being called the death of despair, which is people who die from opioid, suicide, 
you see it's affecting it's affecting more men more men than women because because also this men what happened very from for this men eco economists talk about the marital economy and and these men are not the lost value in the marital economy why would a woman is already struggling to 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 take care of children and parents and also she has to to, to care for a, for a husband that's not it's not working so that's why partly we are seeing decline of, of, of marriage. We used to think that the single single parenthood is something again, I mean, very educated women who didn't want to marry. That's not the reality now. So there are already significant, significant impact on our society. Again, we, the people who usually are, people call them the, the chat, chattering class, the people who write newspaper articles and, 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 and politicians, usually they don't see it. But when I hate to quote President Trump, but when he talk about American carnage, it resonated with many people because what they see around them is carnage. And if you look at Trump, I'm sorry, Trump, Biden's most president, most most successful union address, he was trying to address again working class and middle class people concerns that have not been addressed by our, our, our economic system, political economic system lately. So has has the train already left the station? What what is the solution? It, it just I'm I'm actually turned helpful just recently. I saw an article by Pat Gelsinger, who is the CEO of uh, of Intel, and he said just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do it. Hmm. And and even the 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 people the, the people from Deep Mind are saying no 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 we we should be careful about this technology. And I think there's going bipartisan bipartisan agreement. I mean, both sides are now unhappy with Silicon Valley. It used to be the Republican hated Silicon Valley, but the Democrats love them partly because they got lots of money from them. But now you're seeing unhappiness with Silicon Valley from both sides. So if you ask me until recently, I would say, oh, it is, this bipartisan this tech regulation is a pipe dream. It's just not happening. Maybe, maybe, maybe something is changing. And I mean, what has to change is recognition, I think, the CEO of Intel said it very right. Just because you can do something, doesn't mean that you should do it. So now we need to engage in the discussion. It's going to be hard discussion. There's not going to be easy agreement about what is it we, that we should do versus what we, sh we should not do. And there is a big camp, the people who believe that, that we're taking away the right to make money, they'll, they'll, they'll protest. So the question whether in society, we can find a balance between, again, Letting, letting the free market and unle unleash creativity and innovation, but at the same time saying just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do it. And that's mm. a difficult balance to strike. I think that's going to be the struggle. How are you, Roman? I don't have expertise enough to talk about marriage or women, so I'll stick with AI. I suspect that regulation will not help. Government tends to make things illegal saying that malevolent superintelligence is illegal is as useful as making spam illegal computer viruses both are already illegal and it's not having much of a impact what i'm kind of struggling with is people ask for solutions i honestly admit i have no solutions i just bring problems and many problems but i wish there was more engagement with the idea of impossibility of control impossibility of complete predictability and explainability. And I'm really hoping to see maybe Moshe, maybe someone else at least share why they think it's not the case if it's not, or if they think it may be a possibility, should we somehow do a little more research to make it more acceptable to the wider community? Again, as I said, I don't think anyone in the world claims to have a solution or even a prototype, but the idea that the problem may be too difficult is also not addressed. Hmm. So, so I'll tell you of one, not a solution, but a, a, a way to attack the problem. So I, I work in the area of what we call formal method. We want the computer to, to, we want to be able to take a program and say this program is, is I have a mathematical proof that it will not do something bad. And then these are usually complicated proofs. They are usually carried by machines. And then people say, but can you trust that machines? So people came up with the following, the following idea, which is the says, well, let's try to, to contain, contain the, 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 the risk. Hmm. So what they try to do is they build a system that they have a kernel 
And the kernel has to be fairly small, like maybe a few thousand of lines of code. And then the kernel gives you the mean to extend itself, but everything that is extended is built on that core kernel of trust. Now, we cannot guarantee that the kernel behaves properly, but because it's relatively small and we open it, we're letting lots of people look at it. Lots mm -hmm. of people look at it and people find problems. So it, it's, a shine, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a sanitizing by sunlight, so to speak. Yeah, we're, we're not going to offer you 100% guarantee, but it's small enough and we're gonna have lots of people look at it that we feel more confident. I mean, if you look at the, at the at mathematics, mathematics is built at the end of mathematics, there is, there is the core of mathematics, okay? There's a set of axiom that has the name ZFC, okay? So Melo Frankel with choice, it's a technical term. And it's a small set, I mean, you can write it on one page. And nobody can guarantee there is no contradictions. But for 10 people, it's one page. There are mm. lots, lots of smart people. See if you can find a contradiction. And so far, we have not been able to find a contradiction. So that's the kind of the idea that I think, but right now, for example, if you have code that's, that's, that is, that means openness, it means we open the code, it forces us to say, no, no, you can build the system such that, uh, yeah, here is, I'll open the code, it means lines of code, go ahead and, and, and read it, anybody can read it. It forces us that we must build system in a particular way, so to con it's containment, it's a containment strategy. It doesn't guarantee that there is no problem, but it tries to, to minimize the risk by doing some kind of containment. But we have to agree that this is the rule by which we are playing and we are not there yet to agreement that we have such a rule. So this is not eliminating risk, but trying to, I would say, risk containment. Okay? And this is very often in life, the best you can do is risk containment, okay? Is at least contain the risk to say, okay, here's the part that's risky and I, I have no way of completely eliminating the risk, okay? But, but at least it's not everywhere. Okay, it is here, this is the power, and we're opening it. This is the place where we're opening. So we allow lots of people, you do that, and lots of people can go and try to find bugs in that code and find risk and find loopholes and things like that. So there are ways to do that, but, but right now I, I would say the incentive structure is not there for that to happen. This is part of the problem. The incentive structure is not there. You have to change the incentive structure for people to say, we have to build a system where where risk mitigation is, is number one. I call it, I, I'm trying to promote something, I call it the Lavlasian Oath. So there is the Hippocratic Oath of Doctors. Ada Lovelace was one of the godmothers of computing, and she was the first one, people don't realize it, but she had a disargument with Charles Babbage, who was also one of our 19th century kind of godfather. And people don't know, he wanted to make money, he was an entrepreneur. And she said, I don't have a problem with you making money, but I want to make sure that this is done for the effective, effective use of mankind, for the, for, for the common good, ultimately, okay? And so I think that we need to change to say, yes, it's okay. This is, and this is kind of ethical dilemmas have been around for, 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 uh, for 2000 years. You go back to Jewish literature from the second century common era and they say, what does it mean to be ethical? And this is first, you have to take off yourself. Hmm. But if you only take off yourself, then what kind of a person you are? So we all have this, this, uh, this, this trade-off that we have between being selfish and also but being taken care of other people. And part of thing what happened in the, in the, what was so, I think that what happened with the, with the invisible hand argument, where the reason he got out of hand, one is people did not read all of Adam Smith. He wrote a book about moral sentiments. But somehow the invisible hand gave permission to people to become selfish. It's okay. I can be selfish and still it will be for the greater good. And mm -hmm. this is just patently false, okay? If we have a society where everybody is selfish, it's not for the global good. It's not for the common good. So as a society, we have to come up to this all, you go back 2,000 years ago, and people ask how do, what is ethics, ethics is a bit balancing your own good versus people around you and society as a whole. And if we accept this, if we accept this principle, which not everybody does, if you accept this principle, then we can start having discussions about what should we do, what should we not do? How do we mitigate risk? Okay. 
but we're not there yet. I'm not saying people, you look, I need to put a limit on what, on what you can do for the common good. Same way that we're already, if I need to renew my car registration, even in Texas, I can do it without getting and getting inspection. I can get my car registration renewed unless I show that my car is not, is not polluting too much. Somehow, even in Texas, people accepted that we need to be, <coughs> excuse me, that my freedom is limited because pollution affects everybody else. So that's the principle we need to accept is that, yes, you may want to do something innovative, but it comes with risk to other people. So let's talk about how to mitigate it. Okay, interestingly, the first two papers I published in the space of impossibility results were about unverifiability and uncontainability of AI. And you correctly said that we cannot have a hundred percent guarantee. We can invest more computational resources to increase probability that it's safe. Same with the containment, there is always possibility of some sort of social engineering attack, blackmail, hardware discoveries. So all those things, very safe, very secure, up to a point, if you have enough computational resource, enough intelligence, it may be possible to find a way to exploit those systems. You have infinite regressive verifiers who verified the verifier and so on. And as I said, one mistake is something we cannot afford. It's not cybersecurity, it's AI safety. Making things open actually makes them worse because now you release source code for this very capable, dangerous system mm. to all the malevolent actors in the world. In a perfect world, yes, we would get 8 billion people to agree to sing along, kumbaya, and it's going to be great. Cybersecurity, you assume worst case adversarials, right? You have malevolent actors, you have governments, crazy people, cults, hackers, they all going to do everything they can to take your code and flip a sign on it. You have a system to cure cancer, they put a negative sign, now it's spreading cancer. So in reality, so far, all those things we know cannot scale, cannot work. They are kind of like TSA of security. It feels good, it looks good, lots of people get jobs, but we are not secure because of it. Or we're not sufficiently secure because of it. Hmm. I still, I still think TSA did, did add some security. I still feel better. Oh, Proportionally to the expense. So you put a I still feel, I still feel better. If you say, well, there are people say, let's eliminate TSA. No, no, no. I would vote strongly against it. I want the TSA there to be there. Yeah.